Hey everyone, welcome. We are on Ruth chapter four. So we're we're rounding out our series here with just the ending things and helping us understand uh, that Boaz did the right thing. And I think it's interesting when we start getting into just how prevalent, right? The society of do what's right in your own eyes is back then. So so if we look at today and everybody is doing what's right in their own eyes and how pretty much you do you, it, there's just sort of this air of um, it's okay to be immoral. <laughs> that was really, really the overarching time period back then. That was what was going on during Judges. So if you remember in our first discussions, I, I really tried to help you understand that, that there was a lot of lawlessness back then. And so people were not in the business of redeeming. Okay, uh, we're going to get into some of the history of this, but redeeming someone else's wife, right? If a brother died and you're now having to marry his wife, that was kind of like a, oh, really? <laughs> um, and then trying to find a nearest relative if all the brothers are no longer around, it's like, really? I have to take on this wife? Okay, well, Boaz falls in love with the girl. Uh, the girl seems to like Boaz obviously. And when he finds out that Ruth is in interested in him from the threshing floor incident, he wastes no time, right? He go, he, that very next day, he is there at the get gates, gets his elders together. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. I'm sure he, he was very busy that morning. I doubt he got much sleep after, you know, I think he probably just got up and got to work. So, What's interesting though, is once he got everybody gathered and he had the other redeemer there, uh, and again, remember, people were not in the business of redeeming. It wasn't a, a common thing back then because everyone was lawless doing what was right in their own eyes. So he goes at it from a land perspective. He, he tells him all the good stuff first, just to, I don't know, maybe see what the dude will say. Just, yeah, there's this land and you can buy it. it you have first rights, right? Your your cousin or whomever, right? Your, our, our kinsman, Naomi, needs to sell it to someone in her family and you're first in line. What do you think? <laughs> and he's like, absolutely. Uh, well, then the other shoe drops, right? And he says, oh, it also comes with this girl. It also comes with Ruth. And he right away says, nope, not interested. Okay, what's going on here? There's this uh, levirate, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but the, the levirate marriage, and a lever is a brother-in-law. And levirate marriage um, is something that is a traditional thing based on what we've read, uh, you know, understanding Deuteronomy and what the whole background is on that, that, you know, if a brother dies, to, there's two reasons that we do this, that we that they would do this. One is to keep the land and the family. Two is to keep the name of the brother moving forward. And it's like, well, wait a minute. If the other brother's having the child, isn't it his? Well, the very firstborn male would just be considered the line of the brother or the other person that died. Um, and then any other kids after that would be fine uh, and not in the line of that person. So so it's an interesting thing. It's what God would would consider that line, even though biologically it's not. <laughs> so again, it goes back to I think uh, when we think about God grafting in different lines and people, um, which is wild. You know, it's just a cool thing that you don't have to. You know, it goes back to adoption and how important that is. So, so if we look at the targum, and the targum is a spoken like interpretation or paraphrase of the Hebrew um, Bible, the Torah. And so when it's spoken, when this story is spoken, Ruth chapter four, they add in there that this guy has a wife. Cause you know, he says, I can't do it. It's gonna mess up my heritage, you know, my estate. Well, that could be open to interpretation. Well, again, if we look at what the verbal has been passed down because because remember, people who have who were being read this or who learned Ruth and heard the story over and over and over again would have would have read it or heard it from a perspective of they already know certain things. There are things that 
uh, they, it, they understand. So there's no reason to write that in there. <laughs> so when we talk about this Targum, the Targum was specifically geared toward people who did not understand the Hebrew traditions and, and tr traditions that maybe were lost that they, we don't do anymore. But again, a, a Jewish person today would probably know some of this stuff, you know, if they were taught um, all the different methods of teaching. And they do, they have several different ones because of this oral tradition. So the Targum says that he had a wife and that it would corrupt his lineage. So that's an interesting little addition there to a understanding of what's going on. We've discussed this before, like, were they married already? We don't know, it doesn't say anything. So apparently Boaz wasn't, again, based on the Targum and um, the other redeemer who's unnamed was married. <laughs> so he says, I have a wife, you don't, you take it. <laughs> so that, um, that kind of helps explain some of this story. Then we get into this weird shoe transaction. And the shoe transaction is uh, basically a halitza. And a halitza is this legal way to kind of eradicate this law of the levirate marriage. <laughs> so it, it's this tradition that it goes back to Amos. And if you read Amos, it's, uh, um, let's see, Amos chapter two, verse six, and Amos chapter eight, verse six, talks about selling the needy for a pair of sandals, right? And you're like, what? So the, this tradition that it's halitza in the Hebrew culture, the Jewish culture of taking off a shoe, and it talks about this, that, that you know, the woman would take off a shoe um, of the guy. So basically a guy, the, the man would come in. So how it works in the traditional sense is the man would come in, the brother-in-law who doesn't want to, they, they don't, and usually it's a th thing of they both don't want to get married, right? So either he's already married or she doesn't like the dude, you know, or whatever. So he comes in wearing this moccasin thing, this leather sandal that um, she then grabs his calf with her left hand, takes the shoe off with her right hand, throws it on the floor and then spits on the shoe. That's the actual historical tradition there. It's not, he, she doesn't spit in his face. Other, if you kind of read the translation of that, it's spit like not in his face, but like spit about him. Like you're just spitting on the, on the situation. <laughs> so, so it's an interesting traditional thing, but um, that is part of a transactional historical thing of okay I, and he didn't you know he's obviously not spitting in but it was like i'm giving you the shoe i'm taking off the shoe and you're it, we're now good you are not taking her she's mine <laughs> it's a really interesting thing and you know when you read jewish commentaries the stories of shoes and and feet and all of that they're very particular especially in um some of the uh, like a little bit, um, you know, only put your right shoe on first and then, you know, your right foot is more valued than your left. There's some very interesting traditions in Jewish culture surrounding feet and shoes. <laughs> so you can look into that as well. Okay, when we get into Ruth, then in the story, um, she was given these really beautiful three blessings that she would be like Leah and Rachel, that she would prosper and be famous in Bethlehem. And when we think about that, um, it's like Leah and Rachel, they birthed nations and kings, right? And and Ruth is in that line now. She's, she's grafted in, which is just amazing. And that she would prosper and that she would be famous. And I, I go back to that Proverbs 31 woman because it is a, it just, every time I read it, it just is a clear picture of this woman, Ruth, right? And I don't know if it was written about Ruth. Some scholars say that they think it was, but when we look at traditional um, Proverbs 31 and when it's read, it's read every single um, Sabbath evenings for dinner, after dinner, and, and it's this wisdom and action. So if you read Proverbs as a whole, it's not necessarily talking about this woman that we can never aspire to be because I feel so like, oh, she's so perfect and I'm not, right? <laughs> but when I think about the Proverbs 31 woman in context of Proverbs, it's always talking about woman, a woman being wisdom, that wisdom, they're talking in the she, right? That it's this wisdom. And what's amazing is Proverbs 31 is memorized and read by men. And the men are the ones who read it weekly and out loud. And they used they usually and used to sing it as a song. And um, what's interesting is it's this, it's this Kind of praising of the women of their life, all of the women, and praising wisdom. And it's an interesting um, thing to consider the idea of Ashet um, Hayil. Ashet Hayil is 
this, uh, like the woman of valor, like that very first line um, in the Proverbs 31. So it's Proverbs 31, verse 10. And the hail, the valor, it's, it's really more of a statement of you go girl, right? It's that, yes, like, awesome, let's do this. And it's, it's the praise of, of women and the culture and, and all that they did for the men. So it's a really beautiful thing. And I think of Ruth that she was just highly blessed. So then we move on to Naomi and Naomi, I love this because she went from being destitute in despair, right? Call me Mara. You know, she was so like, just, oh, <laughs> to, man, this woman is blessed and she has a purpose. Um, the term for what she was, because it called her a nurse in the Bible is um, amen. So amen, sort of like if people think oh, amen, amen, but it really is a term of, of support. Um, the, the, one of the best definitions for what she was is a foster mom. And um, we have several foster moms in here and it's just a beautiful thing when you're able to care for another child uh, in that way. That's, you know, it's, it's again, a, another beautiful picture of redemption. Okay, so what's with Ruth then? Like, why couldn't Ruth, wh why is Naomi doing this, right? Okay, well, when I think about helping someone, Remember, we talked a little bit about helping, like to me, it's called the helper's blessing. Um, when you help someone, you are blessed. You, you, you're able to give a gift to help someone, but it, it almost blesses you more. And I am probably one of the worst people to ask for help. And I remember feeling so sad when my mother-in-law died. And I wish this had dawned on me sooner, that when she passed away, I was really praying about, you know, what did, what did I do wrong? I mean, I remember on her deathbed, literally in the hospital, I asked if I could pray for her and I prayed the gospel over her. And I, I, I begged her to, you know, ask for forgiveness in the prayer. And you know, I don't know what, what happened there, but it was just one of those things where I remember thinking, why didn't I have an excellent relationship with her? I've known her since I was 18. I grew up, practically grew up with my husband's family. Like I, that should have been natural to me. But my sister-in-law, who's not a Christian, had this beautiful relationship with her. And I always looked at it as weak because my sister-in-law needed so much help, so much help all the time. She was like desperate for my mother-in-law's help. And Keo, my mother-in-law, um, loved it. She went, she drove all the time. She drove to their house once, twice a week often down in San Diego, an hour away from us. We live, we lived, and she's passed away now, we lived two miles away from her. And she came to our house once for five minutes. I, I never, never did she watch Jacob. She never was around. She, I always begged her, come play, come play with Jacob, come hang out with him. But I, I never said I needed any help. It was just come hang out. And she never did because she didn't feel needed at my house. It was, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Don't worry, you hang out with him, you work hard, it's fine, I'll do it, don't worry. I, I robbed her of the blessing of helping, whereas my sister-in-law gave her the gift of having a purpose. And I, I just, it just killed me every time I think about it that I robbed her of that because of my own, I'm good, I don't need any help. So what I love about this story is Ruth, not only this amazing woman who can do so much and clearly is capable, allowed her mom her mother-in-law, right? To be that foster mom, to be that helper, to have that purpose. And that helper's blessing is so key in this story because we think about the blessing that God gives as a redemption to ultimately help us. And if we were to say, I don't need your help, God, we'd be doomed for eternity. And so just even the helper's blessing between God and us is, is phenomenal. So I want you to consider... Um, this story, you know, we talked a little bit of the veracity of it. We don't need to get too much into that, but that it went from despair to massive blessing to understand that God's timing is perfect and that it is something that I encourage you guys to really um, consider just, just all of this, that this story is this massive, beautiful, redemptive story that, um, that tells us God's timing is absolutely perfect. All right, so I hope that this has been an... an uh, something that you've enjoyed going through and that you've learned something new that you, I encourage you to read Ruth over and over again and, and maybe watch the videos again to see, see sort of 
some of the historical things that we discussed. And uh, I'm excited to announce that um, in the fall, we're gonna cover James. So I'm looking forward to doing that with you starting on September 13th. All right, we'll see you guys soon, bye.